there are two types of flora that strike dread into the hearts of property investors and landlords. One is cannabis. If it turns out that the tenant is running a cannabis farm at a buy-to-let property, and the second one is Japanese knotweed and it is the latter that we're going to be talking about on this Zoom call and I'm delighted to be joined by an expert in this field and it is Stuart Snape who is head of Japanese knotweed claims at Graham Coffee and Co Solicitors um, and welcome along uh, Stuart um, you know this is a topic that crops up from time to time on the forums and I think a good place to start is if you could just you know, very briefly explain what is Japanese knotweed and is one of the issues with it is that it's quite hard to identify. Well, good afternoon, uh, Vanessa. Yeah, I think, you've, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there in terms of one of the biggest problems is awareness. Um, I mean, in terms of what is it? Well, I guess the clue's in the name insofar as it is from Japan. Um, and what a lot of people don't realise is it's, it's been here since probably mid, the mid 19th century when it was brought over. Um, and used in sort of Victorian gardens as a, as a nice, attractive uh, plant. And also, back then, they probably didn't realise how sort of destructive and, um, and invasive it was. Mm -hmm. And over time, as trends have changed and fashion changes, the, the plants obviously have been dug up and, and dumped all over, um, and it's spread, and, and you know, we are where we are now with Japanese knotweed all over the country. And, you know, a combination of, of that plus probably um, the natural progression of these sort of weeds along water courses and, and railways. Um, and, it, and it is now sort of endemic in the country um, and it almost feels as though it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and, and as you say, the difficulty is it's, it, it's a combination of, of it's difficult to identify, but also people not necessarily knowing to look for it. So it's a little bit like a worse wally. You know, if you're not looking, you can't find it. But the moment you're given a picture and you say, can you spot it? You probably can. You know, it, it's a bamboo-like plant. Um, the leaves are heart-shaped um, and they zigzag up the stem and they have a purple tinge. Now, if anyone goes on Google, they can find a picture and I suspect you get the picture in front of you, you can walk around. And if that plant is visible in your garden, you'll probably be able to identify it and, and put two and two together. Um, but the biggest problem is people aren't necessarily first of all, going out looking for it, because until it comes to being flagged up on a survey or, you know, they try and get a mortgage lender to provide some finance, it, it's not something that's in their eye line. Um, and then the other problem is, of course, that it's often, or it can be concealed, you know, so it can be mixed in with other trees and bushes. Um, probably most commonly, it can be under the ground. So the, the biggest feature of Japanese knotweed is the, is the root system. And the root system can spread out for up to seven meters from where the plant is based and uh, these roots are you know the powerful things they can burst through concrete they can destroy foundations now you can imagine when this plant was taken from japan it used to grow on the slopes of volcanoes hmm. and the asphalt would keep it in check but these roots had to be big and powerful to survive on the on, on these volcanic slopes over here you know it's, it's perfect for them so these root systems stretch out for seven meters um, and because of that, it's not just about looking for it on your property, it's looking for it over the boundary. You know, in anything within seven metres of your boundary, there's a good chance that the root system is already encroaching into your, into your property. So is it hard to spot? Not necessarily if you know to look for it, but sometimes it can be hard to see because of you know, things concealing it or, or, or the fact that it's just not entirely visible in your in your garden so awareness is the key i think that's the uh, that's the big catch word for today Yes, and that's really what the whole point of this Zoom call is about, because, you know, one of the things you just mentioned right there was that, that the knotweed travels down railways. And I would imagine that if you have a property or you're thinking of acquiring a property uh, that backs onto a railway line, then you should, you know, you should definitely be on the lookout for, for knotweed in that kind of situation. Yeah, for sure, Vanessa. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's one of the most common, and it's certainly one of the most reported instances where, um, I mean, there's... there's there's, a, there's a, a trained thought, a trained thought, that's a, that's a pun unintended, um, that, that they use knotweed on railway embankments to try and firm up the embankments because the, the root system is so complex, it can, it can provide a lot of stability. Now, I'm not sure there's any real sort of evidence to that effect, but it, it seems common sense that engineers would have gone down that route. So there is a, a massive amount of it across the railways in this country. Um, now, railway companies are aware of it, um, but have they done enough to try and get rid of it? Not at all. Um, it's expensive. 
um, to treat it. And I think to, to an extent, uh, recent court cases uh, have sort of put it under the spotlight and put a bit of pressure on these railway companies. But I think they're still sort of keeping their heads down and hoping that people just don't notice it mm. and play on that lack of awareness to, to hope that it just stays where it is and nobody nobody spots it. Um, because the truth is, if they wanted to, they could rid those embankments of this knotweed and, and take the problem away. Um, but as we know, because we keep finding you know clients who've got houses, as you say, the knotweed's now coming through the fences under the under the fences and and the, the, the railway um, authorities have not done enough to, to shift it. Mm. Well, I can imagine a large part of your work is liability claims and we'll, you know, who's responsible um, and so on. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover that a bit later on in the call. But um, first of all, I think, you know, one of the things that landlords and property investors need to be aware of is that uh, Japanese knotweed being present at a property can uh, hugely uh, impact on the value of that property and also the uh, landlord's ability to get finance on that property. That's the biggest problem with it. So in terms of um, what, that, what, the, what the effect is on people who have, have properties, you've got the obvious um, cost of damage. You know, it, So if you imagine that the root systems and the foundations, you, you've, got to, you've got to pay to fix that. You can't, you can't leave it to continue to cause that sort of damage. You've got the hidden costs of having to treat that knotweed on your property. You've got the extra cost of making sure it doesn't spread. Um, onto neighbouring property, you know, yeah. and there's potential fines of up to two and a half thousand pounds if you let that not be spread. Wow. But, but crucially, I guess there's the, the the loss of value in terms of the stigma that goes with it. Um, not just because it's difficult to find funding for mortgage lenders where you've got this not weed, but people naturally know if they hear that property's got not weed, it, it almost in their mind makes it less valuable. You know, people are reluctant to take on um, property with 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 Japanese not weed. No, the, the, the amount uh, or the, the percentage reduction in property value, because that's probably what everyone wants to know. Um, there's no scientific formula for calculating that. And every surveyor takes a slightly different approach. Uh, but the rule of thumb is anything between sort of 10 and 20%, you know, which is a huge, huge reduction in property value. And of course, you can you can rectify that over time as the treatment's done and as, as the knotweed is, is slowly eradicated. But for somebody who wants to invest, you know, you don't want that added upfront cost. Um, uh, you know, it can be it can be hugely damaging for people, especially as, as you know, as your members are, are interested in investment. You know, that's that's the worst way to start an investment, isn't it? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of uh, landlords um, just rely on the the lender's valuation, which is the lender doing it for themselves. They're not doing it for the landlord. And it strikes me that, you know, well, we've always advocated at Property Tribes to have a, a proper survey done because a survey would pick up. Um, Japanese knotweed uh, in the environs of the property, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, and that's, and that's a crucial point, Vanessa, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think mortgage valuations are um, probably wrongly relied upon a little bit too much in this sort of area, especially when it comes to things like Japanese knotweed. So, yes, surveyors are trained to identify it, and, and the um, Institute of Charter Surveys produced back in 2012 guidance to explain how they should. Um, identify it and describe it in their reports in terms of what risk it poses to the property. And of course, where a surveyor who's carrying out the, the, the buyer's survey misses that, then of course there's a responsibility there to the buyer. But with a with the valuation survey, very rarely will that surveyor go into the, the property, look around the, the outskirts of the property. Mm. It's just about looking out the back window and can you see it growing in the middle of the lawn. It's look over the borders, look amongst the shrubs. What are the telltale signs? Is it at risk? You know, it might not be there this week, but maybe next year it could have been crossed from, from across the fence. So, you know, mortgage valuation surveys are, are very, very dangerous to rely upon if, um, you know, you, you, you're worried about Japanese knotweed. So it's an extremely good point to make. Good, good. Um, I, I learned this from um, you, Stuart, uh, before we started the interview, that it's interesting because new build um, developers, um, they are not uh, needed to disclose uh, the presence of Japanese knotweed. Um, so that means that if you are buying a new build property, um, you can't rely on the developer admitting that there's an issue there. Um, how, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. No, and again, it's, it's another good point. So when a developer buys land to, to, to build on, and I, and I don't want to um, teach grandma to suck eggs on this, and I'm sure your members know all about how developers operate, but they, they'll buy a property to build upon a land. 
the, if there's not weed on the property, they have to declare it to the, to the planning organisations and that will form part of the planning process in terms of treating that not weed. But if you can imagine from a developer's point of view, they want to treat it, then they want to get that house sold. Now, when it comes to selling it, um, they don't have to complete the TA6 form. So they don't have to make a unilateral declaration of whether there's been Japanese knotweed on this property, um, as opposed to a, a sale of a, you know, a second-owned property or a residential property. Now, that doesn't mean you're powerless on, on that. I mean, the crucial thing is, and it comes back to awareness, is buyers need to be aware that you can ask that question and your solicitors should be asking that question. And it's not just, is there any knotweed on this, this property? Has there been any knotweed on the property for the last five years? You know, you could go, go as far as to say since the developer took ownership of the property. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask that question, yes, the developer could lie. Yes, the developer could say, well, look, I don't know. And if you say, I don't know, would you really believe that? Do you really want to take the risk? Well, if nothing else, it alerts you to the fact that further investigation is needed. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that we, we start transactions again, of, of transactions with developers or new build on the basis that have you had not read at this um at this location mm. and not just in my little parcel of land that i'm buying but across the whole development site because the one thing about knotweed it spreads and it spreads quickly that is an excellent piece of advice Stuart. um i've learned something new today and that's uh that's you know it's always a school day in property so we can always learn something new i think you know in my mind, Japanese knotweed is there to, trip, to kind of trip up newbies and inexperienced people. And we do hear stories of, of you know, inexperienced people buying a property unseen at an auction and, yeah. you know, it's got knotweed. And I suspect that many properties with this issue end up in auctions in the hope that, uh, you know, an inexperienced um person comes along and, and and doesn't know to look for it do, do you find that occurring yeah i think i think that's 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 exactly what happens and i think i think also what happens now the the um ta6 form has been updated so when sellers are now selling property we've all seen the declaration on the, on the ta6 form the, the seller's information form and traditionally it's asked you know has there been not weed affecting this property and it's always been a question of yes no don't know the updated form now and in the explanatory notes, what they say is this declaration not doesn't just apply to above ground, but it also applies to below ground. So what sellers have now found themselves doing is because they don't really ever know if it's below ground. I mean, how could they, to be fair? Mm. So it's not just a, a deliberate case of not saying. Almost all sellers, I suspect, going forward will just simply select don't know. And that pushes that risk onto the buyers. So, yes, I think people are hoping that if it goes to auctions, you know, people will go into that and buy it before they have the chance to see it. And I'm guessing the advice on that is always going to have a look around the property, you know, before you commit to um, commit to it. But I think also be aware, I think, that when, when sellers are uh, making declarations, don't know quite often means exactly that. It doesn't mean it's unlikely. It means they haven't got a clue and you need to be alert to that. Yeah, could almost be a, a red flag to go and uh, dig a little bit deeper, excuse the pun. <laughs> um, now, um, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, that there is a stigma with Japanese knotweed for all the reasons that we've been talking about. Um, it, it can be eradicated. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, I think it, it is quite expensive uh, to eradicate it. And also, is it a permanent solution? So once this work has been undertaken, that stigma can be taken away from that property. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, there's no question it can be treated. And if you go to a, any reputable uh, not weed treatment specialist, they'll, they'll normally look at two options. And the, the most expensive option, but the most successful one, is what's called a dig and dump. And it is what it says it is to go in, they'll dig out the section of uh, soil that's affected, they'll take that away. And incidentally, once it's taken away, it's contaminated waste and it gets put in a, in a licensed landfill site. And then they replace the soil. And by doing that, they take out all, all traces of, of the knotweed. And it's important to know, and it's quite an interesting point, that you only need two millimetres of a root of knotweed, and it's, you know, that's barely visible to, 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 for that plant to regrow. You know, so if, if you, you know, carry a bit of soil with a bit of root in it and, and drop it on your way out your garden gate, it's likely it's going to grow. That's how hardy this, this plant is. So dig and dump takes it all away. Um, the second way is um, herbicidal treatment. And quite often if the knotweed's mature and it's big enough, they'll inject it into every single stem. Um, if it's a smaller plant, they'll spray it. Now, that's probably a less 
um, reliable treatment. And there's, there's a good reason why they come with 10 year warranties or 10 year insurance back guarantees, because the truth is it can always come back. I mean, even with a dig and dump, if they leave one little bit behind, you just never know. So I'd say when you do get a treatment, um, the first thing to make sure is that it always comes with a 10 year insurance backed guarantee. Anything shorter than that is not enough. And um, be wary of warranties. You know, if a company comes along and says, look, I'll, I'll sort it out for you and I'll give you a 10 year warranty. Warranties mean nothing if that company's gone 10 years later. So it's got to be an insurance back guarantee. Now in both of those cases with a proper plan, you tend to find all, all the experiences that lenders will accept that. Once they know it's been done properly and once they know that the plan's in place, and especially if there is an insurance back guarantee, uh, lenders are, are more um, willing to consider the funding of it and likewise purchasers are more um, confident that the value's going to be sustainable. Um, but it's all about who you get to treat it. The one thing people must do is try and treat it themselves. You know, yeah. Don't start digging it up, don't start pulling it out and you've got to get the experts in to do it. Yeah, no, I can understand that. You could probably make it worse if you tried to, to do it yourself. This is one of those cases where you definitely need expert um, advice and assistance there. Um, I guess on, on balance from a risk mitigation point of view, Stuart, would you say that uh, property investors should just absolutely steer clear of any property with knotweed or that has a history of knotweed? Or do you think in certain instances, properties that have this association can be reasonable investments? I think I think it's a, it's the nature of um, of property investment to look at things that give you a sort of a, a market advantage or a chance to get a good return. And I guess from the investor's point of view, you just need to go into these transactions with your eyes open because it may well be that they present a really good opportunity. You know, where others may be scared and not willing to put that, um, you know, take on that investment. If you're aware of what it means, if you go into it with your eyes wide open, you know it can be treated. You get the right plan in place. Um, actually, you may find that you get good value property and a really good return on your investment. But I think it's, I would never say stay away from it because it almost gives into the sort of the, the, the fear factor of Japanese knotweed. And the truth is, it, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's something to be aware of and it's something to deal with. And that's pretty much it. But by all means, I think it should, it should never put you off um, as long as you've got your, your eyes open. Just as we close this out, Stuart, um, you're, you specialise in Japanese knotweed claims. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do? And I'm guessing that people would come to you if it, they find out that they've purchased a property where there was Japanese knotweed and it, it wasn't disclosed. Is that how it works with the work that you do? Yeah, so we, 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 get a, we get a lots of different sort of circumstances. I mean, the, the principal ones are where people own properties and Knotweed has appeared in the in the garden, so they know that they're now responsible for getting rid of that knotweed before it spreads to any other property. And they know that it's come from neighbouring property, so it's not their fault. You know, so it's it's about can I can we get that cost back from the people who own the land where it started from? And quite often that can be a council owned property. So you have people who own houses who want to get the costs and, and compensation from the neighbouring uh, landowners. You have people who bought houses with the what they thought was the insurance to the surveyor's report saying there's no problem here. And then they find when they when they move in, there's, there's not weed. And then they want to claim off the surveyor for getting that wrong. And rightly so, because the whole point of that report is to give you the information you need. Um, and sometimes you, you've got people who um, want to claim off the, you know, the solicitors. Uh, I'm a solicitor myself, so I don't say it lightly, but solicitors need to be given the advice. And if a seller has put don't know or no, uh, or, sorry, or even yes, which is the biggest red flag, but they haven't advised the client on what to do next, then of course, that's a problem as well. So there's lots of instances where people have found themselves with not read on the property and you know, that somebody is responsible for that, whether it's, as I say, the neighboring property, uh, or whether it's somebody who sold the property to them, um, who said, as I say, that there's, there's no knotweed here. And we had, a, we had an incident, and, and, it, and it's probably one that, that hopefully doesn't get repeated, where somebody had bought property, and in the back garden, it, it had been covered with a wheat, uh, sorry, wheat, uh, a weed membrane with um, temporary paving flags all over. And they bought the property, and they moved in, and as soon as they lifted up the, the flagstones and the, and the membrane, it was just covered in, in knotweed. They hadn't even cut it down. They just literally covered it over with, with weed membrane and flags. So, I mean, one warning I would give is if you see newly laid flags or things that look like they've been rushed out there to cover something up, 
probably they, they probably have so you know have a, have a look before you buy because the best thing to do is rather than having to come to someone like me is to avoid it in the first place you know and i'm not trying to do myself out of work it's just common sense and to avoid the problem if you can yeah um, well, we know in property that uh, prevention is always a lot cheaper and less stressful and less heartache than cure. But Stuart, it's really, really good to know that there's somebody such as yourself out there who has, you know, very specialist niche knowledge of this area of law. And I have to say, I think you've been the most fantastic contributor. Um, so thank you very much for taking part in this interview for Property Tribes. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, and if anybody wants to contact you, we'll put your details below uh, the video. Um, if they have an issue uh, or there's something about this that they would like to know more about. Hopefully you can also jump on our discussion and answer any questions that the interview might generate. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. One, one thing, if you don't mind, Vanessa, one thing, one thing I, I do want to get across to people is certainly if they if they own property and not weed is, is there and they, and they know it's there, one of the biggest risks for people, who, especially for landlords, is if they don't do something about it straight away, the risk is it spreads to the neighbouring property. Yeah. And just to remind people, there's a, there's a fine of up to two and a half thousand pounds if they don't treat treat that knotweed straight away and stop it from encroaching. But also, you don't want to be on the other end of one of these claims where next door now have uh, knotweed and it's because you've let it cr cross over from your, from your property. So it's just hammering home that thing, which is the quicker you deal with it, the better, because it grows so quick, it spreads so fast. Um, so the moment you spot it, get an expert down to look at it and, and stop it spreading to, to neighbouring property. Um, that's the, that's probably the crucial thing I want to get across today. Well, very well said. Very good point. So thank you so much for joining me, uh, Stuart. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And uh, everybody watching this, I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Stuart. Um, if you've got any questions, please do drop them on the thread and hopefully uh, Stuart can answer them uh, for you on propertytribes.com. Um, but for now, Stuart, thank you very much. And we'll hopefully catch up with you again somewhere down the property trail, but hopefully not with any knotweed running along beside it. Thanks, Vanessa.